All right, we are live. Welcome, everyone. We are the disciples of Yahweh in Christ. Hey, we're live. Oh, sorry about that, guys. Go ahead. <laughs> Sam's got a runaway application or something. No, what I'm doing is I'm watching your YouTube channel because the comments. Oh, okay. So I, I, I thought I'd muted it. But hey, praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Just to let you know, I don't know if you've ever invited him because I've seen you invite experts on Islam. Adam Seeker is here. I see he's yeah. on your mind. Yes, yeah, so yeah he's a mod for us now. Yeah, former Muslim who's a Christian. So, well, he, he's actually been on our program twice. Was that why you lost so many subscribers? No, I'm just kidding, <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding man. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, no, we're I glad have, to have yeah. uh, Adam Seeker out there in the chat keeping order. Uh, thank you, Adam, and all those who, uh, uh, who participate there. Thank you, Sam, for coming out. To, to see us, I'm Scott. My brother is Jody. We are the disciples of Yahweh in Christ. Welcome to our channel. If you haven't already subscribed, please do so. I'll put a link in the chat for you. And uh, today we're just going to be talking about the, the Trinity, the three of us brothers. Uh, Jody, say hello. Yeah, you know, uh, I'm Jody. I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad Sam could come on such a, a quick notice. We didn't plan this you know, just a few hours ago. So I'm glad Sam was able to come. Don't forget to subscribe to his channel, Sam Shamoon uh, at oh, YouTube. And, right. And also, uh, do not uh, uh, also subscribe to our channel, Disciples of YHWH, as Yahweh, Disciples of YHWH in Christ. Please subscribe. Please pray for us. And please just uh, share our video. So we're going to do a topic. Um, we are going to discuss the triunity of God. So we've got a really good expert on the Trinity. We are going to have a discussion with a non-Trinitarian, mm -hmm. Stacy. Uh, so I hope you join us tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Eastern time or New York time. So tell us about what you believe, how you defend the Trinity when you're coming up against all these anti-Trinitarian groups, because there are so many anti-Trinitarian groups, uh, yeah. Islam, uh, Mormons, uh, JWs, uh, Oneness Pentecostals. So how do you go about, uh, as a general rule, going about to discuss the Trinity with non-Trinitarians, Sam? Yeah, thanks for that question. And also, I would, you have a group here called Somali Christian TV, just to let you know. They used to be Muslims, they're Christians. They have a YouTube channel, they're reaching Somali Muslims with the gospel. So if you're ever interested in having them or they bringing you on, I want you guys to connect. So they're here. So I'm trying to get you guys all connected to be a network glorifying the triune God, right. glorifying Jesus. So Amen. Uh, to answer your question, again, I thank you for having me here. And I do truly ask the Lord Jesus to richly bless you, brothers, your family, bless your ministries and prosper you for the glory and the praise of his name. And I ask the Lord Jesus to fill us with the spirit and give us the power, not just to know the word, but give us the power to live the word and obey the word to show the Lord that we love him by obeying the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not because the commands say, but if we are saved in love with Jesus and the Lord himself says, he who loves me will keep my word. So I ask the Lord Jesus for that blessing to show him we love him, to prove to ourselves we love him because he's worthy. And we have mercy on me when I fail in Jesus' name. When he asked me the question, how I deal with the Trinity with these various groups, well, again, it depends on which group I'm engaging with. I do not express the truth of the Trinity the same way <clears throat> with a Muslim or Jehovah's Witness. So if I'm dealing with a Muslim, I'd express the truth of the Trinity in a manner that would make sense to them, but that manner may not necessarily make sense to a Jehovah Witness. And what do I mean? <clears throat> I'm trying to follow the model of the Apostle Paul, who loved the Lord Jesus Christ. May we all be like him, who tried to be like Jesus. We're in 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23. In fact, if you want to read, let's just look at it, that Paul models evangelism for us because he's filled with the spirit and he's inspired by the spirit something that we are not i'm not inspired by the spirit the way the apostles were to give us holy scripture and to speak god's words with the wisdom given to them to express spiritual truths with spiritual wisdom but in first corinthians 9 
19 and 23. If our brother wants to read it for us, Scott, uh, because I don't have the Bible in front of me, I apologize for that. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not myself being under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. So Paul models evangelism for us. And what he's saying is, <clears throat> let me tell you what he's not saying. He's not saying use trickery, <clears throat> connive, deceive, mislead people into believing the gospel. What he means is he entered into the worldview, the mindset of the people, so that he could most effectively communicate the same truth of the gospel in a manner that would be sensible to them and removing as many unnecessary obstacles as possible. So that's why he says, if someone is lawless, I'm not going to come and preach the law and that they're bound to the law. They could care less about the law. So I'm not going to impose it on them until they fall in love with Jesus. It's when they fall in love with Jesus and surrender their life to Jesus, then they will want to come under the law of Christ. And so the way I express the gospel to a Jew is not going to be the same way I express the gospel to a Greek. And you find that in the book of Acts, don't you? When he's uh, at Mars Hill, Areopagus, preaching to the Athenians, he doesn't quote the Old Testament. He doesn't say, and the prophet Isaiah said, or Micah said, or when he's in the synagogues, he's quoting the scriptures. He's saying, turn to Isaiah, turn to Micah, because the Jews believe the Hebrew Bible, the Greeks don't. Though he's presupposing the biblical worldview when he's communicating to the Greeks, he doesn't quote the Old Testament because it's not authoritative for them. And yet he quotes their own Greek pagan poets and writers to express the same truth of the Bible. So here's an example of how to evangelize effectively. I'm not going to talk about the Trinity with the same terminology to a Muslim that I do with a Jehovah's Witness. So you're going to have to know the person that you're witnessing to, enter his mindset, and most effectively communicate the same truth, right? But in a manner that will be sensible to them. That's how I go about it. So I have to know who my audience is, who the person is. And then I take it from there, trusting the Holy Spirit to sharpen me to glorify Christ. Wow. That was good. Uh, that's a good lesson for all of us. We got to know who our audience is. Um, so what would you say the top objections to the Trinity is, uh, Sam? Depending on who. If we're talking about Joe's Witnesses, because we were talking about them, their top objections against the Trinity would be twofold. Number one, they say that the Father alone is the only true God. <clears throat> so... John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Secondly, they point to passages in which they claim Jesus is a creature, specifically the first creation of Jehovah God the Father. And so a Jehovah Witness would attack the Trinity from that angle. The Father alone is the true God. Jesus is the first creature of the Father. And then when it comes to the Holy Spirit, they would try to point to text, depersonalizing the Holy Spirit. So those are the things, those are the things that we as Christians, if we're witnessing Joe's witnesses, must deal with. So that's a Joe witness. Muslim would use similar objections in that Islam, like Joe's witnesses, believe in a unique personal God. And the Muslim will tell you that the God they worship is the one the Bible identifies as the Father. Though they don't call Allah Father, that's an ethem in Islam. You can't call Allah Father. They say, nonetheless, that's the one we believe is the true God who created Jesus. And so similarly to the Jehovah's Witnesses, because they believe God is unipersonal, they'll use the same Bible passages that the Jehovah's Witnesses use to show that the Father alone is God and Jesus is a creature. Now, interestingly, in Islamic theology, the Muslims believe the Holy Spirit is the angel Gabriel. So they wouldn't depersonalize the Holy Spirit. They would try to prove the Holy Spirit is the archangel Gabriel. Now I'm calling him an archangel because tradition says he's one of the seven chief angels. So with a Muslim, I'd have to 
provide similar responses to the same misuse of passages from the Bible, right, that Joe's Witnesses use. Modalism, that's a whole different beast altogether, because the modalists will tell you Jesus is God in that Jesus is either the human manifestation of the Father, or he's a human being indwelt by the Father. So I would have to approach them differently as well. Now, this guy, Stacy, we're going to be talking to tomorrow night, seems like the basic Aryan. He's, he's not a Jehovah's Witness, as I understand, but he seems to be uh, saying many of the same things and using the same passages. So I thought it would be uh, helpful if we go through some of the teachings of the Jehovah's Witnesses and, and debunk those, because that'll be good practice for tomorrow night. Feel free to throw me uh, any objection you want. And Stacy, right. uh, I... I Called him Stan earlier. <laughs> Stacy Tuberville. Yes, he's he is he is more of a modalist, but he does argue like a Joe Witness. But ask me whatever objection, we'll take care of it. All right, we're going to start with uh, uh, an article from JW.org. So this is the Watchtower's online library. The Watchtower from 1953, January 1st, and they have this uh, section here: Scriptures disprove. Trinity teaching. I'm going to start right here. The very fact that the son received his life from the father, that he could not be co-eternal with him. According to the scriptures, Jehovah God, the great father and fountain of life has always existed from everlasting to everlasting. Thou art God, Psalm 36, 9 and 92, 90 verse 2. But the son received his life from the father. I live because of the father, John 1, 18, and 657. Clearly, Jesus owed his existence to God, but God owes his existence to no one else. Jesus Christ is, quote, the invisible, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. God is not the image of anyone, but he created creatures in his image, Genesis 126. I think that's enough to deal yeah, with that's already. Good unpack. That's a lot to unpack. Yeah. Notice the assumption. Let's let's break down their assumptions. First, they assume that Psalm 36, verse 9, and 90, verse 20, uh, 90, verse 2, is the Father alone. Prove that. They're assuming Jehovah is unipersonal. So any Old Testament text that speaks of Jehovah, ipso facto, refers to the Father. No, you need to prove that Psalm 36, verse 9, Psalm 90, verse 2, is referring to the Father as opposed to any other person of the Godhead or to the Trinity collectively. That's the first assumption. And what do I mean? If you open up Psalm 36, verse 9, let's look at it, because the language applied to Jehovah is actually applied directly to Jesus in John 1, 4, showing that as far as John is concerned, that Jehovah most definitely includes the person of the Son. So if you go to Psalm 36, verse 9, what does it say? I'm heading back over to the ESV because I don't trust That's the New fine. World Translation. And we want to have context, which they always leave out the context. Yep. All right, here it is, verse 9. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. In other words, who's the source of life? Jehovah, right? Right. And who illuminates us? Jehovah. It's from his light we see light. But we have a problem. Go to John 1, 4. Speaking of the Logos, Logos, that became flesh. What are we told about the Logos? Who is he and what does he do for creation in John 1, 4? In him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Yeah, that's verse five. I'm confused. So the Logos, in him was life. He's the source of life that gives mm -hmm. life to creation. And he provides the spiritual illumination by his light. But that's what the psalmist said about Jehovah. Why is he applying it to a creature? If Jesus is a creature. And then to make it even more problematic for the Jehovah Witness, in John 1, 9 to 10, we're told Jesus is not just the light. He's the true light, meaning the source of light. See, what does John 1, 9, 10 say? 1, 9 and 10. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He, he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. So now, if Jesus is the true light, and it's from his light we receive light, illumination. And in him was light, meaning he's a source of light. How can he not be Jehovah who became flesh when these are characteristics that are only true of Jehovah God? So that's the first problem we have. Now, secondly, when it says in Psalm 90, verse 2, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. If you look at the words there, it's olam. 
from olam to olam. Now, olam in Hebrew can mean an indefinite period of time or can mean never-ending time. In reference to God, it means he's always been and will always be God. So olam in reference to God would mean everlasting, eternal, timeless. And I, I need to be careful because it doesn't always have that meaning. But interestingly, the language from, from everlasting is actually used in reference to the messianic king. Now, depending on the translation you read, you may not capture it. Like the SV does not translate it, in my estimation, as accurately as it should. But if you look at the New American Standard Bible or the New King James Version of Micah 5, verse 2. Uh, I'm not sure I have an NASB or, they oh, have uh, right here on there or right a New King James. I have the Old King James. Will that work? Okay, if you can do the King James, because here there are two words, Adem, excuse my butchering of the Hebrew, and Olam used in reference to the activities of this soon-to-come human ruler over Israel. And this is cited in Matthew 2. When Jesus is born in Bethlehem, Ephrathah, when Herod asks the Jewish scribes, where will the Messiah be born? In Matthew 2, 5 to 6, they say, in Bethlehem, they quote this. And even the rabbis affirm this is a messianic prophecy. The rabbinic interpretation of Micah 5, 2 is that it's about King Messiah. And I'll show you that in a minute. But about King Messiah, notice what it says in Micah 5, verse 2. But, but you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Powerful. Now, this beautifully captures the Hebrew. Goings forth have been from old, قدم, from everlasting, from olam. You remember what Psalm 90 verse 2 said about Yahweh? You are from olam to olam. Same language used of this human ruler that he's from olam, from everlasting, and his activities have been from of old. Now, what is this saying? It's saying that this human ruler has been active from the beginning. Why? Because he comes from eternity. That's literally the meaning. That's why here, and it's actually plural in Hebrew, goings forth. What does it mean? It means he's been going in and coming out, in and out from the beginning. Interestingly, the word miqaddam is used of Yahweh himself. And Habakkuk, if you go to Habakkuk chapter 1 and you read verse 13, there we're told that he, uh, the, the true God, is from Everlasting, using the same word. If you go to Habakkuk, chapter 1, read verses 12 and 13 for me, if you can. Oh, I'm still over there. Yes, <laughs> Are you not from everlasting, O Chapter Lord my 12. God? Sorry? In 12, it's the same word. Are you not from everlasting? Are you not from Qaddam? Qaddim? And the ruler is from Qaddim. Same language mm -hmm. used of Yahweh that's used of the ruler. So now if you want to finish it, go ahead. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. Yep. So there you go. He is from everlasting. And 13, the reason why I recall 13, because it says you are purer eyes than to look in evil and cannot look at wrong. But anyway, you get the point. There it says the true God is from Adem. Qadem, The ruler is from Qadem, Miqadem. Like Yahweh, he's from Qadem, whose activities have been from Qadem, and he's from Olam. He is from eternity. Now, the reason why I said use the King James, because sadly, certain translations, because due to the influence of liberal critical scholarship, won't mm. translate it as he is from old, from eternity, because some liberals do not accept that prophets could be inspired to speak in such lofty language about the Messianic King. If you remove that assumption and believe that God Almighty is real and can inspire prophets to not only foresee the future, but to receive revelation about the two, true nature of Messiah, then there's no problem for an Old Testament prophet to know that the coming human ruler is an eternal being who enters into creation to become flesh. So as a Christian... 
who believes God inspires prophets to know the deep mysteries of God and to foresee the future, I have absolutely no problem translating the words as they should be translated. This human ruler, born of a woman, because Micah 5, 3 talks about his mother giving birth to him in labor pains so that the Israelites would be his brethren. So he's truly human. He's more than human because he's been active from the beginning because he's from eternity. Same language used of Yahweh is used of this anointed messianic ruler over Israel. In fact, let me let you in on a little secret. That word Qaddam is actually used for the garden being in the east of Eden. If you look at your lexicon, the word east, the garden that's in the east of Eden, the word east is Qaddam. That's the word. Here you have a prophetic hint that this figure has been active from the start of creation because he was there even in the garden in the east of Eden because he's the God that appeared to Adam and Eve. And don't take my word for it. Look at the word Qaddam. Look at the lexical source. It will tell you this is the word used to refer to the east of Eden where the garden was where Adam and Eve dwelt. So the two proof texts backfire against them. So we can deal with the others, but you guys are like awfully silent. I don't know what that means. Are you guys are right? No, we're listening intently is what it means. We're paying attention. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and okay. don't take my word for it. If you get like, I don't know, I usually use Bible Hub, and they'll show you the uh, lexical, the range of meaning for Adem, and you'll see that Adem is used for the garden being in the east. That's the word Adem, east of Eden. So here Micah is telling us this ruler has been active from the start of creation, because he was there when Adam and Eve were placed in a garden that was in the east, Adam of Eden. And he's been active ever since. Because unlike creation, he's from eternity, entering into time, interacting with his creatures, who then becomes flesh. Here's the Bible word study for Kadem. For Kadem. Excuse me. And uh, these are all the different meanings of it. When we click on east, we see all the ways it was used in scripture. Here in Genesis 2.8, the Lord planted Lord God planted the garden in Eden in the east, and that's the word. And who shows up in the garden? Jesus Christ in his pre-human existence. See? So Micah 5.2 uses the same language used of Yahweh's eternality for the Messiah who will be born of a woman to become a human Israelite. And then on top of that, we are told that Jesus is the fountain of life, and we see light from his light, the very language attributed to Job in Psalm 36, 9, ascribed to Jesus. So they're begging the question. They're assuming that any time Jehovah's mentioned the Old Testament, that's the father alone. Don't assume it, prove it. So we dealt with those two. We can deal with the other passages. The other one was John 6, 57, right? Yes, sir. Well, let's look at it because they're assuming that because Jesus says, I live because of the father, somehow that means that he had an origin, that he was brought into being. That's actually the opposite meaning of our Lord's intended, you know, the intended meaning of his words. So what does it say in John 6, 57? As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. Now, assumption. Because Jesus lives for the sake of the Father, that means he's not eternal, the Father created him. But now let's be consistent. Now, notice what our Lord says about those who feed on him. Whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. Now, let me ask you guys a, a question. Before a person comes to believe in Jesus Christ in order to live because of him and feed off of him, whoever Jesus is talking to, they're already alive, aren't they? Yes, bodily they're alive. Right? So even this language doesn't mean that Jesus didn't exist prior to or according to them being given life. It doesn't say given life, but let's go with it. Here you have individuals who haven't turned to Christ, who are still consciously alive, who must turn to Christ to feed off him to live. So even the text itself shows this language doesn't imply going from non-existence into existence. Right? Right. So similarly, where do you get the assumption that if Jesus lives because of the Father, that means there was a point in time he didn't live. Where does the text say that? This doesn't text doesn't say that. And this simply affirms the Trinity. Which Trinitarian thinks that Jesus lives apart from the Father, independently of the Father? That's not Trinitarianism. 
That would be tritheism. The Trinity teaches the Father is inseparable from the Son, who is inseparable from the Spirit, who is inseparable from the Father, so that the Son cannot live apart from the Father, nor can the Spirit live, live apart from the Father and Son, nor can the Father be the Father and live apart from the Son and the Spirit. This is actually Trinitarianism. Third point from this passage. Third point. What kind of attributes must Jesus possess to be able to sustain immortally everyone who feeds off of him? He's got to be on the present um, right? and, and eternal. So while the very passage they think refutes the Trinity, shouts the Trinity. That's, that's very true. Right? So what, what was the other passage? Right, but, very good insight. All right. Uh, John 1.18 is another one they mentioned. Oh, that actually, I, I, I laugh. When, well, how does John 1.18 refute? I think they're assuming the word begotten. I think that's what it is. Because in right. the New World Translation, it says, no one has seen God at any time, the only begotten God. Now, let's, let's uh, go back there. Yeah, and the, in the New World Translation, that's how they render it. So the assumption Oops. I'm gathering is that he's begotten. So if you're begotten, therefore, you're not eternal. Now, let me show you how biblically this is unsound logic so how do they read in their bible john 18 it says no man has seen god at any time the only begotten god who is at the father's side is the one who has explained him that's the new world translation that used by the jehovah's witnesses notice they also put the word g in lowercase mm -hmm. i noticed that hmm. so in other words not only is he begotten but he's an inferior god a secondary deity not co-eternal with the father now does the term only begotten or Jesus being begotten of the father, does that prove he's a creature? Absolutely not. And I'm going to show you from scripture that you have individuals who are begotten, who are already in existence prior to them being born. For example, that same chapter, read John 1, 12 to 13. Same chapter. You can read any version if you want. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So these individuals were born of God after they believed in Christ. That means they didn't have prior conscious existence until they were born of God? No, they would have had to be alive to believe in his name. Right? Right. So they had to already be alive in order to believe to be born. So here again, the Bible refutes the assertion that if someone is born, he didn't have prior existence. Where are you getting that from? It's not biblical language. In fact, even when it comes to procreating children, your child that was born from your wife was already alive in the womb nine months prior to the child being born. Right? Right. So where do you get the notion that if you are born, you didn't exist prior to your birth? That's not biblical logic, nor is it common sense. My wife was pregnant with my daughter, my firstborn. And when she gave birth to my daughter, the day my daughter was born wasn't the day that she came into existence. She was already existing in the womb prior to her birth, which is why we view abortion as murder for that very reason. Exactly. That's a great illustration. I love that. <laughs> right. Now go to First John two twenty nine. But be, before we move, um, why do they say only begotten in one eighteen? Because there is now. Now, when they translated that way, that's not their reason. Put them aside. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses wanted to go with monogamous meaning only begotten, in order to show that he was born and therefore created. However, okay. right now we have a turn. In scholarly opinion, and I recommend because you guys are apologists and uh, serious students of the word, Charles Lee Irons just came up with a massive work where he examined the database that contains all the extent Greek literature prior to, during, and after the time of Christ, and he did a massive search on monogenes and the genes stem, mm -hmm. and his research has led him to the conclusion. Genes does have the notion of birthing to the point that Wayne Grudem, and I recommend you guys get his revised systematic theology, has changed his opinion. And he has a section saying that in the previous editions, he didn't think monogenes meant only begotten. He goes now, because of this research, 
he he has changed his view and now he believes it does mean only begotten so charles lee irons he's a renowned evangelical scholar his research is now changing the tide of scholarly opinion not only wayne grudem but even bruce ware now believe monogamous does mean only begotten so that the church fathers are right in understanding the term to denote birthing not creating ex nihilio out of nothing but that the son is begotten because the essence of the son is the essence of the father and we can get into that but as far as why it's translated that way even now i i've, I've spoken to wayne grudem and it's in a systematic theology book and maybe you want to invite him to interview him he'll confirm this in the updated english standard version because they're going to update it they're now going to go with the reading only begotten because right now in the esv it's translated mm. as only right right but wayne grudem who's part of the translation committee is going to <clears throat> change it to only begotten in the updated version of the english standard version oh okay great thanks for clearing that up let's move on yeah so if guys want to do more research charles lee irons search him out and wayne grudem and bruce ware so now they're changing their opinion now with that said does only beginning beginning deny jesus's eternality absolutely not but before i do that let me just show you how the word for born genomai genao whatever word you want to use the greek word for being born does not mean being born from non-existence coming into existence from non-existence being born from non-existence into conscious existence it doesn't mean that that's not it's used in the in the new testament for example go to first john 2:29 First John two twenty nine. Here we go. If you know that He is righteous, you may sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of Him. Now, brother, prior to Christians being born of God, did they consciously exist? Yes. But if I use the Jehovah Witness logic, if you're born, that means you didn't have prior conscious existence. Hmm. Right. Doesn't work. Doesn't work biblically. So no, that argument has to go out the window. What about 1 John 5, 1? 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. Okay, I'm confused. According to Joe's witnesses, if you're born begotten, you didn't have prior conscious existence. But these people who are born of God were people who believed to be born of God. Well, how could they believe in order to be born of God if they weren't already consciously existing? You see, it doesn't work, does it? No, Even no. when it says someone is dead, doesn't the Bible said we were dead in our trespasses and God made us alive with Christ? Ephesians 2 verses 1 to 7 and Colossians 2 no. verse 11 13. Hold on. Does that mean that when I was dead in my sins, I didn't have conscious existence, conscious <laughs> existing life? Of course I did. So this is a gross misunderstanding, perversion of the language of scripture. Being born doesn't mean you didn't exist consciously prior to you being birthed. So Jesus can be the only begotten son and still be eternal because the language begotten doesn't mean that Jesus was brought into being from nothing from prior non-existence into existence, especially when this is in the context of John 1, where we're already told the word was there in eternity before the creation of time, space, and place, because God used the word to create all time, all space, all place, because he brought all things into existence. That means he's eternal. Right. Yeah. I know, I know the Hebrews chapter 1 uses... Uh, only begotten in reference to Psalm chapter two. Yeah, that, that one doesn't use monogenes. It uses okay. ganao, and it says, today I've begotten you. But that's the messianic psalm, Hebrews 1, 5. It's talking about the day the king was coronated to sit in throne as God's representative, which actually makes my point again. It actually mm -hmm. proves my point. Since you mentioned it, go to Psalm 2. Let's read verses 6 to 7 to see what is the day that the king was begotten, born. And the Hebrew verb would be yelet, and the Greek is ganao, with two news, ganao. Now, in Psalm 2, verse 6 to 7, what does it say? 
As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Okay, now, contextually, the begetting takes place on the day when the king sits enthroned in Zion. Do you see it? In 6, it says, mm -hmm. I have enthroned my king in my holy hill, Zion. So on the day in which the king sits enthroned and begins his reign as king over God's people is the day that God begets him. But that proves my point, because prior to this day, the king was already consciously alive. Yep, that's true. You see? I see. So even this passage shows being born doesn't mean you didn't have prior conscious existence. This right. is the birthing of those who already are alive and are consciously existing, right? They have conscious existence. They're, they're alert. They're alive. So at no point in time does the Bible refer to the begetting of someone who's being brought into existence from prior non-existence. You won't find it. All right. In this, in this uh, part that I read you from the, uh, in this uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, I want to come, come back here. Scriptures disprove the Trinity. And focus in on something here in Colossians 1.15. Not the firstborn. We've dealt with that a lot. What I want to talk about here is they say this, because Jesus Christ is the image of God, they say God is not the image of anyone. That actually begs the question. In other words, they're assuming God is unipersonal. So if you have the Father as the only true God and no one else, then yes. If only the Father is God and I'm the image of God, then I'm not that God, right? Right. But if God is not unipersonal, God is tripersonal, then why can't one member of the Godhead image the other member of the Godhead? In other words, it does not follow that because Jesus is the image of God the Father, he can't be God. All this proves is he can't be God the Father. Exactly, because the God that he images, we're already told in Colossians 1.13, is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because it says that God has translated us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of his love. So Jesus is the image of who? God the Father. And since he's not the Father... He's not his own image, but the image of another. But this doesn't mean that Jesus can't be God solely because he's the image of God the Father. Because if we were to extend that logic, then that means Eve could not be human because she's created after the glory of Adam, who's the image and glory of God. 1 Corinthians eleven seven. 7. So does that mean Eve, who is the glory of man, who's the glory and image of God, can't be human because she's the glory of, of Adam. And if she's the glory of Adam, she can't be Adam as well. I mean, this is, again, not biblical logic. Notice what 1 Corinthians 11 says. says. For a man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. Because man images God, man is the visible glory of God. Similarly, if the woman is the glory of man, it's because she images man. That's the logic here. If you're the image of God, you're also his glory. Therefore, she's the glory of man. She's also his image. Problem is, if we apply this logic, since she's the glory, and by extension, the image of man, she can't be human, according to that logic. Great. Uh, another, uh, just before we uh, go on, Jody, because I'm still in this passage, and then I'll let you go. Um, okay. In this passage from the Jeho Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, what about the two natures of Christ? Because it's true in his human nature that he did receive existence from God. And it's also true that in his uh, earthly life, he imaged the nature and or the character of, of the Father, you know, and the things that he did and the, the way that he ministered. Would that be a good argument to use with them, or is there a reason not to go there? No, well, yeah. I mean, obviously, he's imaging God visibly by virtue of him being man. Because how did Jesus image the invisible God? By making God's characteristics visible. How did he do that? By the incarnation. So obviously, Jesus is God's image as a man in the flesh who manifests God's invisible qualities and characteristics visibly as a man. So yes, that's true that he's the image of God because he's man. But he's more than man because 
he cannot do the things that the passages ascribe to him if he's merely a man, such as create all things and sustain all things, because it says in him all things consist. And then it says he is before all, all things, meaning he's timelessly supreme, timelessly sovereign over creation that he brought into being. None of that can apply to a mere human creature, because as a human, he's part of the creation, which means that if the Jehovah's Witnesses are consistent, Jesus created himself, because it says he created all things in heaven on earth. Well, if Jesus is on earth and he's a creature, then that means the text is saying he created himself. But how could he create himself if he didn't exist prior to him coming into being? That's why the Jehovah's Witnesses have to insert the word other four times in Colossians 1, 16, 17, so that it says in their translation, by means of him, all other things were created. But the word other is not in the Greek. The Greek simply says all things, tapanta. And it's also not in their Greek interlinear Bible either. No. So if this passage wasn't damaging to the Jehovah's Witnesses and did not prove the eternality, the uncreated nature of Christ, why then insert the word other four times? Because they have a broken theology. The only way to fix it is to twist the scripture to their exactly. own destruction. In other words, by inserting the word other, they are <clears throat> implicitly attesting this passage shows that Jesus is the eternal, uncreated creator and sustainer of all things. So they can't have that, so they have to insert the word other. But then I would ask a Jehovah Witness a question. Say, okay, let's assume you're right, that Jehovah God the Father created all things through the Son, meaning all other things besides the Son, because according to you, Jehovah created the Son. Let's go with that. Okay, now here's my question to Jehovah Witness. You also teach that Jesus in his pre-human existence is the Archangel Michael. So he's an angel, though he's the greatest of all angels. All right. Last time I checked, the Bible teaches that creatures, by their very nature, need space and place. That's why in the Bible, the heaven was created before the angels, because heaven is where angels dwell. Angels, being spirit creatures, are still spatial beings in the sense that only God is spaceless, timeless, and immaterial. Everything else that's created is part of time, space, and place. Even though heaven is a dimension that is composed of some different type of stuff, quote unquote, still it is a dimension of space and place. Now that said, you can't have angels who are creatures who are bound to space and place existing before space and place. Doesn't make sense. That means if Jesus is a creature, he's an archangel, and you believe that through him, Jehovah the Father created heavens and the earth, you have this creature who is an angel, who is existing somewhere before there is space and place for him to dwell in. Where was he dwelling before space and place were created? Because only God, by nature, is spaceless and placeless and doesn't need space or place to exist in. But if Jesus is a creature and an angelic creature, he requires space and place. What space, what place was Jesus existing in if you believe that the heavens and earth came after him? Wow, that is a powerful question. I, I've done a lot of study on this, and I've never thought of that question. So how do you answer that, Joe Witness? Wow, that's there very is good. no space and place in eternity, just God. And God is bodiless, spaceless, and material. He doesn't require space. Now, after he creates time, space, and place, he can enter it, manifest himself in it, just like the incarnation. But prior to space and place, you only have God. So if Jesus is an angelic creature, by necessity as a creature, he requires space and place. Where was he dwelling in, Jehovah Witness? If you tell me he's dwelling in God, well, number one, God is not a spatial being for something to spatially exist within. And secondly, nothing in God is created. It's eternal. Welcome to the wonderful world of the Trinity. Amen. I, was, I had a question. I heard you doing a teaching, and I usually use Genesis chapter 5, 1, and 2 in yes. comparison with John 1, 1. Yep. And I heard you on one of your uh, videos say that 
the word uh, Adam was with Eve and Eve I think the translation that I have was man, but you said Adam. Is is it Adam in the Hebrew, or is it man? Yeah. Or explain yeah, what you was doing there. Yeah, yeah. If you can, uh, th this is why sometimes people need to have a King James alongside whatever version, because King James has certain advantages other translations don't have. So if you go to Genesis 5, verse 1 and 2, and if you look at the Hebrew, it's there too. But for those who can't read Hebrew, just pick up your King James Bible. Go to Genesis 5, verses 1 and 2, and read this for me. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. Their ah. name, Adam? That's what it says. Ah. So Eve is Adam? Her yes. name is yes. Adam, right? Okay, so right. now if we apply the Jehovah Witness logic consistently, if Jesus is with God, he can't be God. Well, Jesus can't be the God he's with, obviously. If he's with God, he can't be that God, meaning the Father. But he can be God fully, truly, and still be with someone else who's God. Similarly to Eve. Eve is Adam, but she's with Adam. She's married to Adam. She gets pregnant by Adam and gives birth to his child. So if I were to employ their logic, how can Eve be Adam if she's married to Adam? Did she marry herself? How can Eve be Adam if she got pregnant by Adam? Did she get herself pregnant? See, that's a silly question because it assumes Adam refers to a single person, only one person. No, Adam is the term used for all human beings because the word Adam can function as a proper name. It's the actual proper name of the first male, or it can be used as a generic noun, a district, descriptive noun denoting human nature. So if you're human, you're Adam, but you're not the first male named Adam. So just like Eve can be with Adam and be Adam, and Eve can be married to Adam and give birth to Adam's child while still being Adam, Jesus can be with God, the Father, and be God. So if I were to take John 1 and apply it to the case of Eve, to paraphrase it, I would say, at the beginning, after creation, there was Eve. Eve was with Adam, and Eve was Adam. And I'd be completely biblically consistent. I just want to show this uh, in the Hebrew for those who do know. It says here in verse 2, Wayakra uh, et ha et Shema Adam, and, and he called Shema. their name, the name of them, Adam. There is. No, no definite article there. Yep, exactly. So you catch it, Adam, just like similarly, in the beginning was the word, the word was with Ton Theon, the God, and the word was Theos, because there it's used as a qualitative noun. But that's the whole point. The Jehovah Witness arguments sound convincing on a surface level, until you dig deeper into the biblical text and see their arguments are inconsistent, illogical, and unbiblical. Even John 1.18 backfires against them. I mean, John 1.18, I don't know if we have time to, because I have all the time in the world, but it's up to you guys. John 1.18 <laughs> actually proves Jesus must be Jehovah God. That very text that they quoted proves Jesus must be Jehovah God. If you reread it again, why, why do I say that? Look what it says. If we have time, we can unpack it. Yeah, let's do it. John 1, 18, no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Okay, I'm really confused. It says no one has seen God at any time. All right. Mm -hmm. Any time would include the Old Testament period as well. That's any right. Time. Okay. Now, the Greek word comes from orao. Now, orao can mean to see with your visible eyes, but it can also mean perceive with the mind's eyes, like your mental perception, like, hey, I see your point. In the context... There, see, contextually is better rendered as no one has understood God without Jesus explaining him. Because the emphasis is not on seeing God with the eyes, but comprehending God. And you know that if you look at the Greek, it says, explain them, exegesato, that's from the word exegesis. Literally, it says, Jesus has exegeted God. If you look at the Greek, it's exegesato, sorry for the Erasmian butchering. It's the word where we get exegesis. Jesus exegetes God. Mm -hmm. Right? You see it. That's You're right. confirming it. Exegetes God. 
In other words, it's not about seeing with the visible eye. It's perceiving, understanding God's nature correctly. And no one can know God truly, comprehend God truly, and know God intimately apart from Jesus making God known to that person. So it's not just seeing with the eye, visible eye. It's also perceiving with the mind. Either way, you cannot know God or even see God visibly apart from the Son in His grace making God known. Now, here's my problem. Isaiah 41 verse 8 says, Abraham's a friend of God and he saw God visibly. Well, John 1 18 says, no one at any time can know God and see God unless the Son makes him known. So then, who is the God that Abraham saw and knew intimately? Who is the God that Moses saw and knew intimately? Who is the God that Isaiah saw and knew intimately? Well, if John is consistent, doesn't contradict the Old Testament, that must be Jesus appearing as the God of the patriarchs, or you have a contradiction. For example, go to Exodus 24, verses 9 to 11. Then Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clear clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. You cannot behold God visibly or know God intimately unless Jesus reveals him. That's what John says. Now, we're not Jews who reject the New Testament. We are Christians. Even Unitarians believe the New Testament. Even Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm -hmm. Well, if John is consistent with the Old Testament, it doesn't contradict it. Now you're left with the dilemma, Jehovah Witness, Stacy, and everyone else. Who is the God they are beholding? Who is the God they're conversing with? Who is the God that Moses is speaking face to face to? If the Bible is consistent, that God must include Jesus appearing as God and revealing God because no one can know God truly and intimately or see him visibly unless the Son does that for you. Well, another, another passage that I'm thinking of, oh, whoa, oh, yeah. Another passage I'm thinking of is John 17, 1, where Yahweh appeared, uh, appeared, but yet, Genesis, right? Gen not Genesis 17, 17 1. Yes. And not only that, it's Genesis 18. But let me show you one passage in particular where Jesus is showing up that perfectly confirms John 1. Yeah, Jesus appeared as Jehovah to Abraham in Genesis 18 and Genesis 17, other places. But let me give you one that's mind blowing if we read carefully and not skim over it. And this is not just a Christian interpretation, you have Jewish sources written by Jews who are not Christians, like the Targumim, the Aramaic paraphrase of the Old Testament, where the Jews translated Hebrew Bible into the Old Testament. A translation work that began right around the time of Christ, as evidenced by the Dead Sea Scrolls, and continued. In these Aramaic par paraphrases, which you can find online, translated in English, oftentimes you'll find that where a verse says, Jehovah God appeared or said, the Jews translated as, the word of God came, the word of the Lord said, the word of the Lord appeared. And the Aramaic word is memra, memra Yahovah, memra Adonai, memra Mar. So even the Jews saw from the Old Testament, their reading of the Old Testament, there is this word that God sends. That's not simply God's audible voice or his command, but an actual person, a messenger, sent by God to speak to God's people, who is God. The Jews got that just from the reading of the Old Testament. And I'll give you one example from the Wisdom of Solomon, which is a Jewish work, though Protestants don't accept it as canonical. But before we do that, let me show you where Jesus appears to Abraham, perfectly confirming John 1. John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things came into being by that word, and nothing came into being without him that came into being. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. Then we're told about that word of John 1, 14. And the word became flesh, tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So who is Jesus? 
that eternal word that created all things, gives life to all things that became flesh. All right. With that said, go to Genesis 15, if you don't mind, brother. Genesis 15. Now, pay attention. Now, your translation doesn't do you justice because it omits a Hebrew word, saying. And it's in there in the Hebrew. Kol, saying. It's there. But be that as it may. Oh, that's King James. Go to ESV real quick. If you can. Uh, this or, is the King James, okay, actually. Yeah. King James again, man. Look how it translates. Read it for us. Mm -hmm. James, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Who came and who's speaking? The word of the Lord. Wait, the word of the Lord is the one speaking? Yes. That's the word that was there in the beginning who became flesh, apart from whom you cannot know God? That's right. So here's Jesus, Jody. He's the word before he became flesh. But let's continue <laughs> the conversation because we're going to read all the way to six. You said you said cool, which is Arabic. It's Amr yeah. in uh, Hebrew. Oh, Amr command. Oh, I'm sorry. See, that's what <laughs> Amr. That's right. I'm sorry. See, what happens? The Arabic is poisoning me, guys. No, nah, they're sister languages. It's easier to confuse. Uh, maybe the I should then, Maybe I should go to his brother. <laughs> Just kidding. No, you said sister language. I'm, yeah, yeah. yeah sorry. Okay. So, <laughs> what, what are we doing? What was I supposed to read? Now you read Genesis 15:1. The word of the yeah. Lord came to Abraham in a vision, saying. So yep. the word is there, Amr, saying, yep. yeah, I got the Arabic Quran, cool, Allah Wahid. Anyway, now continue reading all the way to three. And Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me you have given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is my heir. So he called the word, Lord God, Adonai, Yehovah, Sovereign Lord? Uh, yeah, Adonai Yahweh. Okay, I'm confused though. It sounds like John 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, the Word of God, and the Word was God. So here the Word of the Lord is the Lord. Now he's telling the Word, you're my God, my shield, but you've given me no air. Now notice 4 and 5, verses 4 and 5. And behold, the Word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be your heir, but he that shall come forth out of your own bowels shall be your heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven and tell the stars if you are be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall your seed be. Okay, I'm a little confused, Scott. Here it says he took him outside. That means the word was inside a location. That means the word is appearing visibly. This is a Christophany. He's appearing visibly inside. Now, Abraham didn't live in an apartment. This would have been a tent. So he appears inside the tent. He says, come outside, look at the stars. And then this is the passage that Paul uses to prove his doctrine of justification. Notice verse 6. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. The very passage Paul uses is the passage where the word of the Lord appears to Abraham. And by trusting in the word of the Lord, Abraham is justified. In other words, Abraham is justified the same way we are. He was justified by believing in the word of the Lord before he became flesh, like we are justified by believing in that same word now that he's become flesh. Well, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So whether you believe in him before or after his incarnation, Hallelujah. all the and same. Not Jesus there. So John was right. He knew his Old Testament better than the Unitarians. Let me give you <laughs> one more example. One more example of the word appearing as an actual person visibly. If you go to Jeremiah 1, open up Jeremiah 1. And I want to remind everyone as he goes to Jeremiah 1. I'll tell you what verses in a minute. I want to remind everyone as he goes to Jeremiah 1 who that word is in John 1. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things came into being, were created by him. So the word created all things, everything, meaning you, me, the prophets. Watch here in Jeremiah 1, verses 4 to 5. 4 to 5. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. 
Wait, wait. The word of the Lord is saying, I created you. I formed you in the womb. Once again, he's coming and he's saying, Amer. Mm, Amer. And I, I am the one who made you. Perfectly agree with John 1, 3. This is the word that created all things and gives life to all things. And the word is already telling the prophets, I, the word, made you. And I made you for the purpose of being my prophet. It's like Jesus says to the apostles in John 15, 16, where he says, you did not choose me. I chose you, chose you and appointed you. Same language, right? But now watch what this word does. That was verse 5. Read now from 6 all the way to 10. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a youth, for to all to whom I send you, you shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Mm. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. So See, I have... Scott, the Lord has a hand? I have put my words in your mouth and he touched his, his mouth. Yeah, all right. He put out his hand. I see. Put out his wow. hand and touched my mouth. So the word of the Lord, whom Jeremiah knows as the Lord, is appearing in human form. And physically touches him. So he feels the touch. Wow. And that symbolized I'm putting my words in your mouth. Now, that was nine. Finish it at ten. See. I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. There you go. Here again is another example of the word, not simply God's audible voice or his commands, but an actual person, a messenger sent by God who appears to the prophets in visible form who they know is God and claims to be God and does the things of God. So John 1, for a Jew, up until verse 13, a Jew could amen John 1. Yes, John, in the beginning was the word, amen. He's distinct from God and is God, amen. That's the word that God used. They would have no problem with any of that. The only controversial point would have been when he said the word became flesh. That's when they say, wait, 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 whoa, one second. John, we're <clears throat> amening you up to this point. That, that word... We know about it from the Hebrew Bible, but you said he became flesh. You're saying the word became human? Yes. Who was that word that became human? Jesus of Nazareth. Oh, wow. That would be the only thing that would have been controversial. And to prove my point, folks, you don't need to find the Targums or read Philo, the Alexandrian Jew, Philo of Alexandria, a, an Alexandrian Jew who was a contemporary of Jesus and Paul who was writing theological treatises in Greek to convince the Greeks of the truth of Judaism, where he mentions the logos. He says the word is the second God, not created, not uncreated, because he believed that the word proceed from God, chief of the angels, the high priest who sits on God's throne. Even Philo, this Jew, knew this before John wrote John 1. Where are they getting it from? The Hebrew Bible. That's where they're getting it from. And I'll prove it to you. You're going to need the Apocrypha or the Deuterocanonicals. So if you, can, if you can't find it, I'll get it for you. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 18. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 18, if you can find it. Wisdom. Yep. The Revised Standard Version, Catholic Edition has it. New Revised Standard Version, Catholic Edition, they have that too. Or think, New American think, Bible, Revised Edition. I they, think New Jerusalem Bible has it too. Yeah, that has it too. That would have it. Yeah, so when you get it, when you get to chapter 18, notice this is a pre-Christian writing written by Jews before Jesus. And though Protestants don't accept it as canonical, that still doesn't mean it doesn't have value for the Protestants who reject the Deuterocanonical slash Apocrypha. So if you go to Wisdom chapter 18, read 13 to 16. Tell me what this sounds like, verses 13 to 16. For whereas they would not believe anything by reason of the enchantments, upon the destruction of the firstborn, they acknowledged his people to be the sons of God. For while all things were in quiet silence, and that night was in the midst of her swift course, thine almighty word leaped down from heaven out of thy royal throne as a fierce Ooh. man. Ooh. Yeah, I, almighty, almighty, the almighty word. word leaped down from heaven out of your royal throne as a fierce man of about, war. This is talking about Exodus 
during the time where God killed the firstborn of the Egyptians. Who did it? Your all-powerful word came down from your throne. What did he do? Keep reading 16. Uh, your almighty word leaped down from heaven out of your royal throne as a fierce man of war into the midst of a land of destruction and brought your unfeigned commandment as a sharp sword and standing up filled all things with death and it touched the heaven, but it stood upon the earth. So the almighty word appeared in visible form like a huge giant figure so big that he reached the sky while his feet was on the earth. How did these Jews know that God's almighty word is an actual divine person who sits with God on the throne, who will come either to save or destroy God's enemies by his sword. Because if I didn't tell you this was a pre-Christian source, you'd think I'm reading the New Testament. The all-powerful word with a sword slaying God's enemies who comes from God's throne. Now compare this to Revelation. Go to Revelation 3.21. Revelation 3.21. Uh, hang on i've lost my window it's gone it's gone bye-bye it'll come back <laughs> you think so no, no, i'll open up let me know if you need me to open up the bar okay revelation 321 321 sorry about that uh get my share thing over here the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. So Jesus sits where? On his father's throne, right? Yes. Right. Now read Revelation 19, 11 to 16. Who is Jesus and what does he come to do? Revelation 19, verses 11 to 16. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So Jesus is the word of God. He comes with the armies of heaven as their leader, and he will slay God's enemies with the sword of his mouth. That sure sounds like what I read in Wisdom 18, verses 13 to 16. God's all-powerful word comes down from the throne with his sword to slay God's enemies. So the question for everyone is, where did the Jews get this from? The Hebrew Bible. The Hebrew Bible is not Unitarian, it's Trinitarian. So to say that Jehovah in the Old Testament is the father alone is a distortion of the Old Testament and the misuse of Hebrews 1. But that's how I would respond to the Jehovah's Witnesses. Feel free to ask me more questions because I can do this for hours if you want me to continue, unless you have specific Oh, objections. man, come on. Preach it, brother. I have, I have another go. one. Um, one of the things that the Jehovah's Witnesses and also the modalists and the various Arians like to use is Deuteronomy 6.4 to say, since the Bible says God is one, he can't be multipersonal. He can't be a trinity. Even though the word one, achad, is used in Genesis 2.24, where it says, for this reason, Genesis 2.24, a man shall leave his father and mother and cling to this wife, and the two shall be basar achad, one flesh. So according to their logic, Adam now becomes Eve, Eve becomes Adam, so that they're gender confused and they're a single person. That Genesis 2.24. It's right, Masat so Achad, one. Same word. Achad. They can't be two people anymore. According to them, right? They can't be male and female anymore, right? Nope. According so to that logic. They're making, strong, they're making a strong case for transgenderism. <laughs> <laughs> or unigenderism. Yes, even that. You see, so you see the point? So yeah. no, that's not true. The word one in Hebrew has to be defined by its context. If I say one family, who would assume that's one person? One nation, one person. So it is the context that will define whether one is referring to a complex unity, multiplicity and unity, diversity and unity, or a singular person. To say, well, one means unipersonal, prove it. Show me that's the case because... 
That word echad also appears in the book of Job, where Job then used a plural participle to describe God as makers. For example, go to Job 35, verse 10. Job 35, verse 10. But none says, where is God my maker who gives songs in the night? Now, you know what the word, now you pick it up, you, you, you read the Hebrew. The word maker is the plural of asa. Asa means literally, none says, where are my makers? It's a plural participle. It's none say, where are my makers? It's referring to God as makers, plural. It's right there. All right. Even those who can't read Hebrew, if you go to Bible Hub, interlinear, it gives you it in transliteration, and then it tells you it is, I think it says verb, cal form. Yeah, it's masculine. right here. I'm, I'm showing you in Logos. Verb, cal, participle, masculine, plural, construct. Masculine, plural. Why is God said to be makers? But then here's what's ironic. In Job 31, 15, it says God is achad, achad maker, one maker. Job 31, 15. Did not he who made me in the womb make him, and did not one fashion us in the womb? Did not Achad fashion us? So the makers is Achad. A plurality in singularity, in unity. And then let me give you another example where God is said to be makers and husbands, plural participles. Isaiah 54, verse 5. For your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and the Holy One of Israel, Israel is your Redeemer, the God of the whole earth he is called. Okay, look at your Hebrew. Husband is the plural of Baal. It's Baale. And maker, again, is the plural of Asa. It's uh, Asa. It's plural. It's literally your makers are your husbands. Your husbands are your makers. But then it says his name, singular who, I believe. Is Jehovah of hosts. Is his name. Who? Yes, masculine, singular. But the word maker and husband is plural. Look at it. It's plural. It's makers mm -hmm. and husbands. Am I making it up? Mm -hmm. Confirm it, my brother. So well, it's right there. Uh, I'm hovering so people can see. When I hover, you'll see down at the bottom of the window, it shows you the uh, uh, grammatical uh, constructs. Uh, this is a masculine plural construct for husband and for uh, maker, participle, masculine plural construct. So why in the world are the inspired authors speaking of achat, one God, as makers, husbands, plural? One more example. This one I like a lot because it now uses the verb bara, but in plural, because here was asa, make. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. The word creator is plural. Remember your creators. That's why even the Young's literal translation translated as a true plural. Creators. It's the plural of bara. Now, uh, this here in my uh, Logos software, it is saying singular. But no, actually, uh, I don't know why I would say that, because let me give it to you right here. Bible Hub, you can open it up. It's a plural participle. One second. That's interesting. Why they say that? Hey, let me go over there too. Go to the word uh, creator there. It should be there. Ecclesiastes uh, 12. All right. Yeah. Flip over there. Yep. Yeah, here it says it's masculine plural construct right here in the Bible Hub. All right. I'm going to switch to Bible Hub. Yeah. Let me get you the link. Uh, if you are not there, I can get it. Oh, you got it there already? I got it. Okay. Look at it. See. This one says masculine plural construct. So it's plural. Mm -hmm. So it's remember your creators. But now just to show you, if you go to BibleGateway.com, you'll see Young's literal translation. It even gives it to you in the plural, creators. Oh, I have Young's literal on my Logos. Yep. Somewhere. Check it mm -hmm. out. You'll see. So I'm not making it up. I didn't invent this. I learned this from. Oh, here it is. Someone okay. John, like, uh, yeah. I just got to switch windows for you guys. So you can watch over my shoulder. Remember also thy creator is in days of thy youth. Why plural? Because it's plural. So wait, the one true God 
who's Echad, who's Ahuhi, is creators, makers, husbands. Wow. Mm -hmm. Cody, are you like shocked or something, brother? <laughs> well, I, you know, if I'd have heard this when I was a modalist, it would have blew my mind. And as a Trinitarian, it's still blowing my mind because I've never actually heard heard this before. So this this would have definitely blown me away if I you know was still a modalist. Yep. So oh. what's the point though? Echad does not rule out a plurality. That's that's actually silly. That's a misuse and abuse. But at the same time, we don't want to go to the extreme opposite ex uh, opposite extreme. I've heard Christians say Echad always means plurality and unity. That's not true either. We need right. to be biblically accurate and balanced. And secondly, Amen. I've also heard Christians say Yahid, some pronounce it Yahid, means singularity. That's not true either. Yeah. Yahid would stress the uniqueness of God. For example, when God says to Abraham in Genesis 22, 2, take your one and only son, it's Yahid. But no one would say that Isaac is literally the only son of Abraham because Ishmael was there before him. So it means unique. So even if God were called Yahid, it wouldn't mean he alone is God in the sense of being a singular person. He would be the only God, but multi-personal. It would stress the uniqueness of God being different than anything in creation. So I just want to be clear on that. Yeah, that's a, that's a good corrective. Another thing I wanted to, to, to take a minute to talk about is, you know, we sometimes say, oh, Jehovah's Witnesses will say this and Jehovah's Witnesses say that. But a lot of the people who are Jehovah's Witnesses have been misled. They're like sheep without a shepherd. It's their leaders who have, have twisted the scriptures and lied to them. They don't even know what's really true. They, the, everything they learn is from the people who are, you know, their teachers and their leaders. So in a similar way to, you know, what we see in the scripture, Jesus was after the Pharisees and the scribes who were misteaching the people, but he wasn't so hard on the people themselves because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Most of the Jehovah's Witnesses you meet are like that. They haven't seen the truth. They don't, they're, they're not aware that there's anything other than what they're taught. And we do have sympathy for them. And, you know, uh, we want to show the love of Christ to them and not say, you are twisting the scripture or you this, but, you know, maybe point out it's the Watchtower Society that does all these scripture twistings and, and they've been lied to and misled. Kind of like the Muslims, you know what I'm Absolutely. saying, guys? Absolutely. Perfectly stated. I couldn't have said it any better. And that's, again, I know people think I'm harsh. I'm only harsh with those who come and blaspheme, attack, and pervert scripture. Because I track that. That's on YouTube. But I can say, I, most Joe's Witnesses I've met, the sweetest, most humble human beings you'll meet. I agree. And, and I have to say, the JWs are more, you know, use the Bible more than our Mormon friends. I mean, they, you know, they mm -hmm. got all these made up scriptures, at least the Jehovah Witnesses stick with, you know, scripture, but then, then, you know, they won't say their Watchtower magazine scripture, but it really is to them. Exactly. I agree. So I agree with you. I, they're such beautiful people. And I've, I, I've only met one person face to face that came off a little rough and tough. For the most part, they're very humble and peaceful and gracious. And it's sad and breaks my heart because one of the people I met was a pediatrician who had a professional medical practice and yet was so zealous for Jehovah. He would spend 50 hours going out there before COVID and standing on a street corner in Chicago below zero for Jehovah and his kingdom. And he was a doctor with a medical practice, a pediatrician. Mm. Yeah, so and my heart broke for them. And he was such a wonderful man. And his wife was such a wonderful woman. And you know what? I pray because I spent about a year with them and I couldn't make any headways. I couldn't. Mm. And that's, again, another reminder. Yeah. You're just a tool of the Holy Spirit. You pray the Holy Spirit will penetrate their hearts and shake them enough to consider the points you're making. But at the end of the day, you're not going to convert anyone. Right. In fact, when I gave them the argument, where was Jesus before the creation of heaven and the earth? He told me that's a mystery. We don't know. It didn't even budge him. He didn't even know dent. It just, that's a mystery. We don't know. And moved on. Right. It reminds me, look at uh, the scripture, uh, Proverbs 26, 16. You, you showed that to them? What was their response? 
Oh, no, this is just what uh, the status of people who have been lied to. Oh. The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. Now, I would, you know, again, apply this to the leaders, to the people who have done the scripture twisting in the first place, not to the, the ordinary uh, person that you're going to meet. But uh, there are some people that just can't be convinced. The, the apologists, you know, we know this one Mormon apologist who uh, won't be convinced by anything. And he's, you know, we, we saw this verse and said, this really applies to those people who are teaching these falsehoods and teaching it to others and, and being the leaders and apologists, keeping people. Uh, I, I saw a, a, a nice comment in the, um, in the chat. Oh, oh I, I've lost it. Hang on a second. Um, it was Rod, Rob, sorry, Rob. Rob says, Jehovah's Witnesses leaders have a veil placed over their eyes, a false theology. Yes, indeed. There's a veil over their eyes there. And, and the people are like sheep without a shepherd. Uh, I think this is a good place to start wrapping it up. Sure. sure. Yeah. Like I said, um, uh, thank my- you so much for your time, Sam, and everyone who came and, and participated in the chat. Uh, we appreciate your passion. I know sometimes the chat gets a little bit uh, pugilistic, but uh, <laughs> we're passionate about scripture and about God. And and we appreciate everyone who, who comes out and listens. And we, we thank Sam so much for coming out. Uh, remind you that we... Point, brother. Yes. I just want to hammer this. My brothers, please don't see people as numbers, but as human mm-hmm. beings, create an image of God. And you need to pray for them. And secondly, you don't have one approach. The way I witness a Joe witness will be different to a Muslim or a Jew. Keep that in mind and ask the spirit to guide you. What approach works most effectively in getting that particular person to see the beauty of Jesus Christ, because our hope is they get saved and not remain in their sin. So keep that in mind. That's all I want to say. Amen. We become all things to all people. And we do always need to keep in, in, uh, keep in mind who our audience is. You know, if you're talking to the, to the sheep that have been misled, we're gentler, we're softer. When you're talking to those apologists, those hardened hearts, those Pharisees, then we can be a little bit more, um, um, assertive as Jesus was. So yes, we do, we, we do uh, uh, appreciate that, uh, that uh, caution there, Sam. And we thank you for coming out. Uh, we are the disciples of Yahweh in Christ. So please check out our YouTube channel for other videos about Islam and, and uh, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses. We've had lots of uh, wonderful guests. Um, and uh, you know we have a bunch of, of content up there. We're still growing. We appreciate your uh, uh, support in prayers, in subscriptions, in likes, and, and, and coming out here on our live streams. And uh, Jody, what do you have to say? We just uh, appreciate Sam coming at such a short notice. Don't forget to watch us uh, Thursday night at 7 p.m. with uh, Stacy. Uh, it should be a lively discussion. I know Stacy's a nice guy. Sam's a nice guy. So we're going to have some fun. It'll be like a like barbecue Stacey. without the barbecue. I like him. He makes me laugh. So hopefully it'll be pleasant. I'm- <laughs> right. I think Stacy's a good guy. And if you're listening, Stacy, we love you. But, yeah. um, you know, join us Thursday at 7 p.m. And, you know, please subscribe to our channel yeah. if you haven't already. Disciples mm-hmm. of YHWH in Christ. And we're just trying to spread the word of God. Most of all, pray for us. And then, second of all, just share our videos with your lost loved ones, share them with people who don't uh, put this particular video, who don't believe in the Trinity, because that's such an important teaching in the Bible. So God bless y'all and God bless America. Amen.